The month of February is not only Black History Month, but it is also American Heart Month. And for that reason, today's Black History Moment is for Dr. Daniel Hill Williams. Dr. Williams was an African American physician and educator, born in 1856 in Pennsylvania. He is credited with the first successful heart surgery. He graduated with a medical degree in 1883. Dr. Williams practiced medicine in Chicago during a time when there were only three black doctors in the city. Dr. Williams was highly regarded as a skilled surgeon and his practice grew because he treated people of all races. However, he was keenly aware of the limited opportunities for African American physicians as well as the inferior treatment of black patients. When a woman was not allowed to attend a nursing school because she was black, Dr. Williams founded Provident Hospital and Nursing Training School in 1891. Two years later, he would perform the heart surgery on a man who had stab wounds to the chest. Dr. Williams performed the successful surgery to repair a tear in the lining of the heart, which saved the man's life. Dr. Williams' practice remained active in Chicago until he suffered a stroke in 1926. Dr. Williams retired to Idlewild, Michigan, where he lived until his death in 1931. My name is Deshana Yamini, and this has been today's Black History Moment. Together, church, let's lift their hands all over the room. Sing Hosanna in the highest. Let us Hosanna. Come on, sing it out, Holy City. Sing Hosanna. somebody and tell them, say, don't miss the moment, I sing, sing everything you need is waiting for you, tell them, and if you could just believe, somebody say, a little deeper, you'll see him move, Rubik from city right here, and you see him. I believe he can, I believe 
It's a simple matter. Nothing too hard. Nothing too hard for God. He can do that. He keeps every promise. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. God, be with us today as we break bread in your word. I pray that every listening ear has a heart to receive this word. I sowed this word of encouragement. I sowed this word believing that every marriage, every family will be obedient to your instruction and wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. This is uh, part three of Marriage Breaker. So today we're going to close out our series of Marriage Breakers. Uh, I pray that you guys have been eating good. I pray that you guys have conversations in your home about what God has been giving me to share with your families, um, with your spouses, with your children. And so we're going to jump right in this. Uh, we ended last week on the fifth plague. So today, this morning, we're going to start on the sixth plague. All right. Talking about plagues that destroy our families and marriages. And like I said, today, we're going to be able to close this out. And then next week, we're going to move on to the next thing that God has given me for our families. All right. So the sixth plague, we're not going to tear it. The sixth plague, and I'm going to hit these quick. I'm going to hit these quick, so if you're taking notes, I hope you're ready. The sixth plague that destroys families and marriages is failed business ventures. Yeah, yeah, I know your husband, I know your wife, they've been talking about this business that they've been wanting to get started. Failed business ventures is a plague that will destroy our families and our marriages. Bad business decisions. Bad business decisions will tear our families and our marriages apart. The closing of a business. Hard times at work can cause frustration. It can cause anger and irritability. A lot of times, these emotions are directly expressed to the family in a negative way, causing terrible problems, and at times giving destruction in the home and in the marriage. All right? Bad decisions as it relates to business. Number seven, a successful business. <laughs> I know y'all probably saying, what? Yeah. Although success in business seems like an unlikely marriage breaker, it's almost as risky as a failed business venture. Because now that your business is succeeding, now that you got a little money in your pocket, now you feeling yourself. Now you feel like you don't need your family. Now you feel like you don't need your spouse. Now you think you the shit's naive. Oh man, you got success in your business. You done came from the, from the bottom. Now you think you've arrived. Being a successful business person is worthless if you lose your family in the process. I'm going to say that again. Being a successful business person is worthless if you lose your family in the process. This is the very reason why your priorities must be in order. While it's great to want success, all that is good. It's great to have to be a great, successful businesswoman or businessman. But our priority should always be the success of our family, the success of our marriage. If success is the result, of sacrificing your time with God and your family, then what, then what you have uh, 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 is not going to satisfy you. You won't be able to enjoy what you got if God and your family is not first. Go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Let's go there. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and I want, I want you to meet me right there at verse 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Verse 13 and 14. This is what it says. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches 
kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. Verse 14 says, but those riches perish by evil travail and he begetteth a son and there is nothing in his hand. Let's look at the CV. It says, I have seen something terribly unfair. People get rich, but it does them no good. I like this. Suddenly they lose everything in a bad business deal, then have nothing to leave for their children. I want you to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19 as well. This is what it says. Every man also to whom God has given riches and wealth and have given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Let me tell you something, church. While it is important to enjoy everything that you have attained, everything that you've worked hard for, it is more important to love and safeguard your family. Hear me clear this morning. Yes, you want to work hard for everything that you work hard to get. Yes, you want to keep it. But we have to work that much harder to protect and keep our families together. Number eight, we're moving fast. The eighth plague that destroys families and marriages is marriage at a young age. Oh, yeah, I know you're getting hot, you're young, you think you're ready for marriage. But, but, but marrying at a young age is destroying our families and our marriage. Statistics show that young people that enter into marriage between the ages of 17 and 20 have the highest risk of divorce than those who get married between the ages of 21 and 25. We are living in a society that influences people to believe that marriage is nothing more than living together, and if it doesn't work out, then y'all just go get a divorce. Like, that's acceptable. But I'm here to tell you that divorce is not acceptable just because things are not working out. So I got a question. When are young people ready to get married? When? Well, I have to say, when Jesus is the center of our lives, and this is just not for young folk, when is anybody ready to get married? The answer to that is, once Jesus becomes the center of your life, you now are ready for marriage. Until Jesus becomes the center of your life, I don't think marriage should be on your mind. When a person is in love with Jesus, when he is Lord over your life, when a person serves Jesus and live according to his word, then they are ready to get married. Oh, I don't know. I done stepped on some toes this morning. If you are single, my single people, if you are single, I am telling you today, I'm telling you, you are blessed to hear this message today. You're blessed to get a word like this before you walk down the aisle. Before you consider getting married, consider your relationship and your status with Jesus Christ. Is he the center of your life? Are you serving him? If you are not, I'm telling you right now, you need to remain single. If a person is not serving God, and God is not the center of their life, I'm telling you, you asking for a hard way to go if you are considering marrying a person. If a nappy head little boy is trying to marry you, young lady, you need to make sure that Jesus is the center of his life. I don't care how big her behind is. I don't care how good she looks, man. If Jesus is not the center of her life, I'm telling you, you better keep on walking. I'm trying to save you the headache, the heartache right now. Because I know that if a person loves Jesus, if, if, if Jesus is the center of someone's life, and they are following God, I guarantee you that person is going to make you happy. I know without a shadow of a doubt that if you love and follow God, it's certain things that you will do and it's certain things that you won't do. 
you will have a certain standard, a certain quality of life. It's certain. It's a certain way. If a person, if Jesus is the center of somebody's life and you decide to have children with them, it's a certain way they'll raise their children. It's a certain way they'll, raise, they'll, they'll run their household. If you love God, there's a certain way, a certain way that things that I know you won't have to put up with. Let me get back on subject because I'm, I'm going a little to the left. When are young people ready to get married? I'm telling you, I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down. When are you ready to get married? When you're, financial sta when you're financially stable. That's the, se that's the second uh, 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 timeline. When you're ready to get married? When you're financially stable. If you are not financially stable, go sit down somewhere. You shouldn't be thinking about no marriage. Many young people are not financially stable to pay their own expenses. Either they don't have a job, or if they do, they don't earn enough. If they don't have enough to financially support themselves, then they're not ready for marriage. Men, if you don't have enough money yet to provide and take care of a woman, a family, a children, don't, you, you're not ready yet. When are young people ready to get married? When their careers are established. Do you have a career? Is it established? I strongly believe that young people have the capacity to be spiritual and intellectual. When a person graduates with a diploma in the field or in a career of their choice, the chance of finding a good job and getting better wages are much greater than those who never went to school or quit halfway into their education. So there are some preliminary things that need to be addressed before we consider marriage, before we consider walking down the aisle. Men, before we consider going on one knee and asking a young lady for her hand in marriage. There's things that got to be addressed. Young people are ready for marriage when they are emotionally stable. If you still hurt from your high school break up, uh, uh, high, high school, high school fling, or your high school sweetheart, they broke your heart and you're not emotionally stable, you're not ready for marriage yet. If young people are dependent on the guidance and opinions of their parents before making a decision, then this is indicative. This is a reason of emotionally, emotional immaturity. Young people. Young people need to be emotionally mature and stable before making the decision to assume the responsibilities of a serious relationship such as marriage. I'm going, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something right here. I strongly believe that the information given throughout these series of lessons will help every young or single person who's considering or having the thought of marriage. These lessons will help prevent major mistakes that others have made. I'm going to tell you right now, I wish I had teaching like this before I got married. Young people often get married for the wrong reasons. I'm going to give you an example. For pregnancy. Just because you got pregnant, you think you got to get married. A pastoral advice to all parents. And I'm going to say this, and, I'm gonna, and I stand on it. Never force your daughter to get married if she is not in love with the father of her child. A force marriage because of pregnancy is always a mistake. Remember that two wrongs don't make a right. Never get married to get away from your parents, young people. I said this earlier on when this series first began. Because dysfunctional families will make the children want to leave home as quickly as possible. Many young people believe that running away from their problems at home is the answer. 
And according to the confused way of thinking, the answer to their family situation is marriage. The household that they come from is so dysfunctional, they'll do anything to get away from it. They're willing to marry anybody. But you and I both know that that is a terrible mistake. Never get married because you're lonely. Some young people feel alone and they feel unloved, which causes them to make the mistake of getting married to end their loneliness. They ignore the fact that marriage is not the answer to their loneliness and make the wrong decision. Never get married because of your hormones. Young people will be motivated to react to their hormonal changes if they are not completely committed and dedicated to God. We got to get dedicated to God. Your hormones will push you to making the wrong decisions and to act irrationally. And here's number nine. Here's the last plague that destroy our families and marriages. Are you ready? You put your seatbelt on and your wig on tight. The last plague that destroys our family and our marriages is in-laws. Oh, man. Pastor, you starting some trouble this morning. Yeah, in-laws would destroy your family. In-laws would destroy your marriage. I said it. It is established in the word of God that when a person decides to get married, oh God, thank you for this word, that he and she should leave their father and mother when, when, this, when this biblical principle is ignored or violated. Divorce is almost inedible. In, it, it's going to happen. I can't say the word. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. It is inevitable. The Bible tells us, leave your father and mother and cleave. Y'all know the rest. When we disregard this law, this principle, divorce is knocking at the door. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 says, Therefore, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Many children are still dependent on their parents, but they need to remember that once they make the decision to say I do, once they make the decision to get married, their commitment is to their spouse, not to mom and daddy. Unfortunately, the emotional and spiritual dependence of the kids prevents them from learning to live independently, which eventually affects their marriage. Now, let's take this step further, a step further, and, and ain't nobody told me nothing. My, my gift just working for me this morning. Let's take this a little further. Living with your in-laws, I'm telling you right now, don't do it. If you're living with your in-laws and you are married, it's a big mistake. It is a risk that your situation is going to end up in a divorce. So what's the answer? What's the answer to this problem? I'm going to tell you right now. If at all possible, man, don't live with your in-laws. Don't do it. Do not live with your in-laws, and I need you to take control of your family. Take control of your family. When families live independently of their in-laws, the husband feels respected and the wife feels secure because there are no outside influences or, want, or unwanted advice. If and when you are in need of godly advice, I'm telling you, make an appointment to speak with your pastor or a leader in your church or any other responsible person. And I want to end by discussing this unfounded jealousy. Say that with me. Say, unfounded jealousy. Many divorces are caused by unfounded jealousy. What is that? What's unfounded jealousy? It's a type of jealousy 
that a person has when they fear the loss of a valued relationship to a uh, to a uh, 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 revival, even though the person's partner has not misbehaved. You ever seen that son and mother relationship? And when mom realized that the son is head over heels over a woman, she becomes jealous because she thinks that this young lady is going to take her child away from her. She thinks she's not going to be able to go get those pedicures no more or be able to do this or that with her son or that this new young lady is going to take her little baby away from her. That's that unfound jealousy. See, this happens a lot with moms and their sons. Most moms fear losing their children to someone else. And unfounded jealousy begins to creep in. Many divorces are caused by unfound jealousy. Mothers, your son are not your husbands. You got to let them go. Dads, your daughters are not your wives. You got to let them go. People who are jealous are being influenced by the enemy to see things that are not real. That lady don't want to stop the relationship between his mother and, and, and mother and son. You're seeing things that are not there. Your, your, your son's still going to buy you a new bag every year. You and your daughter will still get to go out and get your nails done together. So just cut it out. And there's two types of jealousies. Two types of jealousies I want to cover, and we out of here. One is demonic jealousy. Go ahead, type demonic. Demonic jealousy in the chat. Demonic jealousy. This type of jealousy is based on insecurity and fear. What are you afraid of? It is perverse. It's irrational. And it causes a divorce. The person who feels this type of unfounded jealousy is already experiencing the punishment of insecurity and fear of someone coming along and taking away the person that they love. And that's right. I said you are experiencing punishment because that's what the devil is using to torture you. Fear. Pastor Bradford just taught on fear last week Bible study. And the devil uses fear to torture you, to punish you. So when that unfounded jealousy creeps in, the devil begins to punish you with your insecurity and fear. And he puts in your mind that somebody is coming along to take away the person that you love. And that is so far from the truth. Proverbs chapter 6 and 34. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 34 says, For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Look at the Amplified Version. It says, for jealousy enrages the wronged husband. He would not spare the guilty one on the day of vengeance. Don't allow the devil to put fear in you, insecurity in you, and punish you with that and make you feel there's something there when it's not there. Unfounded jealousy, demonic jealousy. The second one, the second type of jealousy is called a holy zeal. Yeah, say that. Holy zeal. Type that in the chat. Holy zeal. Z-E-A-L. Come on, let me see that in the chat. Holy zeal. And I want to go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, to give us some clarity on what holy zeal is. Exodus chapter 20. Meet me right there in verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. And I'm going to read the Amplified Version because I want this to be clear. Exodus 20 and 5, Amplified, says, You shall not worship them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous, impassioned God, demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine, Visiting, avenging the iniquity, the sin, the guilt of the fathers of the children that is calling to the children to account for the sins of their fathers. 
to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Tell you right now, church, God is a jealous God. This type of jealousy or zeal protects what belongs to you. So there's a difference between the two. There's demonic jealousy and there's holy, a holy zeal. But this type of jealousy or this type of zeal protects what belongs to you. It is not based on insecurity or fear, but rather it is based on love. In other words, he is, a, he, he is jealous because he loves you. It is proper to feel jealous when it comes to your spouse. It's that, that's proper. When it comes to your spouse, it's okay to be jealous. Yes, but only if this jealousy or zeal is the kind that rises up when danger is ahead and not unfounded jealousy based on a misguided imagination. Do you get that? There's a difference. James 4 and 5. Come on, let's go there. James 4 and 5. This one says, do you think the scriptures mean nothing? The scriptures say the spirit God made to live in us wants only for himself. I'm going to tell you again. The Lord is jealous when his children love the world more than they love him. Why? Because there's danger there. When we love the world more than we love him, there's danger. So God is jealous about that. People with an out of control kind of jealousy hold on to what they have using manipulative and controlling methods in an effort to prevent losing it. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We don't want to get out of control and be manipulative to control people because we're afraid of what we're going to lose. And I want to share some characteristics and traits of a jealous person. You ready? Write it down. They're possessive. They're manipulative and they're controlling. They're selfish, insecure, and they're fearful. They're fearful. Those are some characters and traits of a jealous person. Why are some people jealous? I'm glad you asked. There's several reasons why a person might feel jealous, including some of the traumas that they've gone through. Past emotional wounds, rejection of their parents, abandonment, or great differences in age. For example, when one spouse feels too old or too young to be with the spouse. So what's the solution to jealousy? Write it down. Off the top, we have to learn to trust God. Learn to trust God. Trusting in God means to completely yield or surrender to God without reservation. Don't hold back. Surrender your family and yourself to God to trust him. The next thing we got to do is we must renounce the spirit of jealousy. Cast it down. The spirit of jealousy begins to affect people when there are traumas and emotional wounds from the past that have not been dealt with properly. Deliverance is necessary before you can be free from the spirit of jealousy. You must be restored to gain that trust that was lost in your marriage and your relationship. There are many more marriage breakers that we need to discuss. But I want to share with you the most common ones. And, un and unfortunately, many of these marriage breakers are also affecting Christian families. Christian relationships. And it's very imperative for you, for us, to do a self-analysis. Check yourself. Check your relationship. Check your marriage, your family. Do a self-analysis to see if any of these elements are present in your relationships within your family and your spouse. If you can identify any of these in yourself, then you need to get rid of them completely. And you need to begin to develop strong relationship again. Because somewhere you fell off. 
you must correct what you are doing wrong. The only way to accomplish this is to repent. The only way to accomplish this is to repent and seek God's divine intervention in your life. Will you do that today? Will you do that today? The doors of my father's house is open. The opportunity stands now for you to repent and get back on track. You may say, Pastor, you know what? I haven't been treating my spouse right. Pastor, you know what? I've been in a relationship for years. I want to marry this woman. I want to marry this man. But there's some things that I heard you say today that I need to get right. I need to repent. There's some jealousy that I know that I have in my life, and I know it comes from things of my past. Past hurt. I need to repent. This is your time now. Heavenly Father, repeat after me. Forgive me for my sins. Help me. Deliver me from past hurt. I forgive those that have sinned and trespassed against me. I free them and I free myself today. Thank you for a new start. Thank you for a clean slate. Now, God, help me be the best spouse, be the best brother, sister, have the best relationships ordered by you in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to thank you for a new chance at life, a new chance at our relationship. God, we thank you for these tithes and offerings. We thank you for every giver. God, touch these hearts. Bring in new resources. Bring in more, more resources so we can continue to do the work of your kingdom. I pray that every hand become involved in this ministry, whether it be financially, whether it be with their gifts and talents. Bring more resources, God. Thank you for those who have been faithful. Thank you for those who have a giving heart. In Jesus' name, continue to bless our marriages, continue to bless our singles, and continue to bless our relationships. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and God bless you.